Heat Map was founded in early 2016. We're headquartered in Palo Alto, California. We also now have offices in uh, Beijing and Guangzhou. Um, currently looking also to expand very soon into Europe. Uh, right now we've got about 100 people and, and we're growing fairly rapidly. So if you know any really good uh, solutions or embedded or localization engineers, send them our way. Um, so why do maps matter for AVs? Uh, why are they so important? So uh, autonomous vehicles really use maps to understand first and foremost where they are in the world. Uh, once they understand where they are in the world, uh, they can use a map to figure out how to get from their origin to some destination, from A to B. Um, and while they're on that, uh, on that path, um, they use that map uh, to also understand what's around them, uh, and then also what maneuvers, uh, based on what's around them, uh, what maneuvers can be safely or uh, legally executed. Uh, and then lastly, um, they can also, this is important, use maps to help to predict the behavior of dynamic objects. So of course, as an autonomous vehicle moves along its path, it's tracking pedestrians, cyclists, and other vehicles. Um, part of uh, the prediction problem is a very challenging problem, but um, given that there are semantics and rules of the road, generally um, a map is a good uh, heuristic uh, or an indication of uh, the likely behavior of, of a dynamic object. So for all these reasons, uh, an AV uh, relies pretty heavily on a map, right? It essentially, we, we pre-compute all the static, all the relevant static information in the environment, and then that then essentially acts as the vehicle's memory, right? Uh, it understands what that environment is going to look like before it enters it, saving a whole bunch of computation and making uh, path planning and prediction much more efficient. Uh, all in all, then kind of just making the operation of the vehicle much more safe and reliable. So what does that mean? Um, if the map is essentially another sensor for the car, then of course it needs to be accurate, right? So um, the vehicle needs to understand where it is in the world, uh, let's say, less at less than 10 centimeters, uh, translationally. Uh, and so that means that a map, of course, needs to be less than 10 centimeters uh, in terms of over, like, overall error. So it needs to be accurate to say, let's say five centimeters. Uh, it needs to be complete. So you need to have all the relevant features in the map. Let's say 99.9999, as close as you can get to 100% if that's ever even possible, in terms of feature recall, mean, meaning that they're there and they're, they're accurate. It also needs to be scalable. Maps are semi, well, fairly intense process. Map creation is a fairly intense process. So how do we ensure that a map is gonna be maintainable uh, and scalable? They need to be everywhere the cars are gonna be. So what does this all imply? This implies that a map really needs to be up to date and fresh, always. And that's, that's, a, that's the hardest problem with HD maps today, is how do you maintain them, right? There's the initial creation, always. It's sort of a one-time so kind of sunk cost, but the steady state of a map is really maintenance mode, map update, and that's the hardest problem. And that's where I would say a lot of traditional map making methods struggle, right? So they use survey fleets that comb uh, mostly highways. There's not very many uh, of those survey vehicles on a relative basis. So you have long lead times in terms of when the, the vehicles can move into an area, create, collect the data. They usually do large scale maps all at one time, meaning that it takes a long time for them to build and to QA. And then the, of course, then that data is stale. So the map is not as fresh or as up-to-date as it can be. It's also a challenge in terms of how the vehicle actually, autonomous vehicle actually consumes the map. So in this case, the map maker, the map provider, is completely detached from how the, the vehicle consumes it, right? They provide a database, essentially, of, of map data. And th then the consumer uh, of the map, or the customer, needs to figure out how to, how to consume that map, right? How to localize within the map how to construct a, a planning horizon, and all these things. So there's, there's a fair amount of extra effort from the customer in terms of integrating these maps. And, that, and, and so to do this well, you'd have to scale a fleet, let's say of thousands of vehicles. That would be enormously costly, right? To, to have that many vehicles roaming around all the time to capable of maintaining these maps. You'd have extraordinary sensor costs, and that doesn't even account for the integration costs of the customers, right? So how do they actually have to take those maps and they have to sort of mold them into their own sort of unique version of the map, which is a whole bunch of extra effort on top of the initial map creation. And again, it just takes more time and leads to more stale data. So what does that mean? I mean, it kind of means autonomous vehicles are a little bit trapped with uh, some traditional map making methods. The solution as it stands today is, is 
very costly, the data is stale, and, and the maps are, are, are expensive. And, and so that means slower development and increased time to market. So that uh, leads to what we found at, 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 you know, at, at DeepMap and why we exist. So our philosophy is that really the HD map is absolutely a necessary piece of the AV software stack. Um, it, it, it really is an extension of the sensors of the vehicle and is necessary for um, really uh, safe uh, operation of autonomous vehicles. So in order to achieve that, we believe that mapping and localization uh, really must be provided as a service, as a, as a, as a software service, uh, not necessarily just a database, right? We believe that an autonomous vehicle uh, needs to not only be capable, of course, of consuming the map, but also creating and updating the map. And how do we, how do, we do that? Uh, we deploy uh, a, a, a suite of services to the vehicle, uh, not just deliver a database like traditional map makers. Because uh, in essence what this means is, so the vehicle can, can of course collect the data, create the map. Uh, the, the map the, our services allow the vehicle to also localize uh, very, very well. And once the vehicle is localized very, very well, let's say below 10 centimeters, it makes uh, change detection much more, uh, much more robust and easier uh, and much more scalable. So uh, you've got this essentially virtuous cycle of, of map accuracy. So an accurate map leads to accurate localization, leads to accurate and, and scalable change detection, leads again to a more accurate map. Um, if, if you have poor localization, if you don't have this feedback loop, um, uh, a very tight feedback loop, um, it just leads again to inaccurate localization. It leads to poor change detection, it leads to stale data, it leads to slower developments and less reliable autonomous vehicles. So that's what we do. We have built a, a suite of services that operate in the vehicle uh, that allow the vehicles to make use of their existing sensors to both capture and, and consume the map. So, our data capture service takes the data directly off the sensors, converts it into our compressed proprietary format, which allows us to send it directly to the cloud, where we have a, our, our map creation pipeline. We sort through that data, we generate a very high quality map, at which point it's immediately validated with multimodal localization. Meaning all, our, all of our maps before they're shipped, we ensure that our localization service can consume that map data and that, that we are offering you know, best possible localization from both LiDAR, camera, using IMU, GNSS, uh, it's all validated. And then then, once it, then it's in the car, the car can immediately consume it and, and localize and consume that map. Uh, and so essentially allowing um, us to generate a whole bunch of change candidates, highly accurate change candidates that are sent then back to the cloud. It's that virtuous cycle that I was talking about. So here's a list of some of our in-vehicle services. And it's kind of complex here in the middle, but what I, the way I like to abstract this is say, we have, there's basically three inputs. Um, a set of waypoints or destination, um, a fresh map, and sensor uh, output from the sensor. It's fed into our, our, our in-vehicle services, and you get four, three inputs, four outputs. You get a vehicle location, uh, you get a route, an HD route, centimeter level, uh, along the way, you get a planning horizon telling you what, uh, what features are around you and what legal maneuvers there are. And then, of course, we're generating a whole bunch of change candidates. So let me uh, switch over to some videos here, and I can talk a little bit more about the map that we generate and some of our, some of our capabilities. It starts with an occupancy map, right? So this is what we use to localize. Uh, we use some of these brilliant Velodyne sensors to, to capture all this data in 3D, and then we basically we make sense of it by breaking it down and rebuilding it, essentially a volumetric reconstruction of the environment in five centimeter voxels. Now we can vary the voxel size depending on the solution that you need, but uh, five centimeter resolution allows very, very uh, robust and precise localization and very, very robust and precise change detection. From this data, we can also start to extract uh, what we call the landmark features, or kind of what's more commonly known as like an HD map of essentially the vector data. So you see here uh, all the connectivity of the lanes, the signs, the traffic signals, the optimal drive path, intersection, navigable boundaries, and the like, right? This is kind of a, your more common conception of an HD map. 
um, which some people try to localize against. But you can imagine, right, you saw the map previously, that rich 3D data uh, versus kind of the sparse geometry data. You can imagine localizing versus in a rich 3D environment versus kind of the sparse environment, um, which gives you a better result and which, uh, which allows you to detect changes in the environment more completely. This is obviously the merger of the occupancy map and the landmark map. So you can see here vehicle driving through this, this roundabout, following the, the path prescribed and, and localizing in this 3D environment. So a little bit more about our localization then. We use a multimodal uh, sensor fusion approach. So we will make use of all the LIDARs on the vehicle. Well, many of these L4 cars have, are running multiple LIDARs. We will make use of the camera data. We will make use of the IMU data. We will make use, to some extent, though we don't rely very heavily on it, on GNSS. And that allows, we, we fuse all that data together and generate the best possible localization result and also generate not just a localization result in six degrees of freedom, that's X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, yaw. Of course, we're also generating uncertainty values uh, or a covariance for those that are a little bit more technical. What's not, it's not only important to understand to localize the car, but you need to understand how well you're localized. So if, if you're seeing failure from LiDAR, you're seeing failure from camera, if you're fe seeing fa failure from GNSS, then you know to ignore that and rely on one of the other sensors. This redundancy is super critical to safe operation of autonomous vehicles, and that's what allows us to do this so well in all these different conditions. You see in the rain, in the snow, on the highway, in the city, all these different conditions, and this is super critical for safety. And again, uh, once our maps are shipped, we can, you know, a, a medium-sized city in a couple weeks, all that's been validated with different localization approaches, and our localizer can immediately consume that in the car. So there's no, none of this, uh, take the data, sort of mold it, figure out how to build a localizer on top of it, test, uh, so, you know, in the meantime, the map data is getting stale, so it's not even right. This is all happening real time. So what you're seeing here is we're localized. This is actually fairly recently in, in Palo Alto, near our, our headquarters, where there's always lots of construction going on. And uh, it's a fairly simple change detection case. So once the vehicle is localized, we know very well what is supposed to be in the environment, right? What the navigable surface looks like, how many lanes there are, etc. So as we drive along, we detect some cones. You can see here. So these uh, are, are not supposed to be in the navigable surface. So uh, we can either rely on, uh, take this from our customer's uh, perception system, if they have it, or certainly uh, we would build one of these ourselves to supplement it, because ultimately, at the end of the day, we're responsible for the quality of the map. Sometimes our customer's perception system is sufficient and, and can detect all these relevant things, but sometimes it's not, and so we'll build something that will supplement it. So in this case, it's traffic cones. So as we scroll through here, you see the, the, the live detection of these traffic cones. So once this is under, understood by the vehicle, a snippet is taken and it's sent to the cloud, right? I talked about uh, allowing these vehicles to both consume and then update, ultimately update the map. So uh, a snippet is sent to the cloud where a review task is generated in our back end, and then ultimately a human moderates this. Now, in the future, yes, maybe this will be automated, but right now when we're talking about 99.999%, you know, automation isn't, isn't that reliable, and anyone that tells you otherwise is probably not telling you the truth. So we actually have humans in the loop, and we try to do this in a really smart way, where we generate these tasks and classify them as such. So um, those cones are then loaded in a tool, or those detections, contextually, right, they were sent to our back end with some geolocation, right, from our localizer, and those were verified. So very quickly, it's verified, and you can see cones show up in the map, sent right back down to the vehicle, and this lane is closed. And that would be then immediately also consumed, uh, updated in our routing API, so uh, a vehicle would not be routed through this lane any longer. So that any, any subsequent vehicles, after that detection has been verified, that change has been pushed, would be very quickly uh, routed around this, or, or know very well that this lane is no longer available for an autonomous vehicle. You can see here, it's red, 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 red. Okay, cool, well thank you guys.